Hi everyone, my name is Kylie. I'm the Academic Support Services Coordinator here at JC at LISD Tech. And we have a couple of guests here to present on test taking today. So we have Angie McCullough and Dr. Carolyn Scott, and they're here from Rainbow Rehabilitation Center in Ypsilanti. They work with patients who have experienced traumatic brain injuries and also other neurological conditions. And oftentimes they counsel patients who are returning to school on things like test taking and test anxiety. So hopefully they have a lot of good information for you today. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Carol, Carolyn and I are excited to be here. When I presented the idea to Carolyn, she was all gone ho. So we hope during the next hour or so we can give you some tips both to better yourself and better your test taking, but overall just to, so you can walk into the test taking room and feel more comfortable um, when you arrive. There's going to be a lot of information, so the resources we gave you, go back and look over once you leave. Um, if you open your blue folder on the right hand side, you'll see your PowerPoint. It'll look like this. This is every slide that we're going to go through today. Uh, so you, most of everything that you need will be in there. There is space for notes if you want it. On the left hand side, you're going to see a series of handouts. These sort of reiterate what we talked about in our quick reference guides if you don't want to flip back through um, the PowerPoint. The key points are in here on anxiety, time management, learning strategies, and then some things on concentration. You'll also see this. It's a handy thing. It's like a bookmark or just a quick reminder that you can have a nice way to calm yourself if you're starting to have a lot of anxiety. Um, Carolyn uses the stop, stop technique quite a bit in her wellness class that she teaches. So what we do, I stick this in my planner sometimes, or you could stick it in front of your notebook as a gentle reminder that you're going to survive and it's going to be okay. Take a deep breath. So Carolyn's going to do the first two sections, and then I'm going to do the last two. So I'm going to move over and let Carolyn start. All right. So like Angie said, we're going to be talking about a few different things today. We're going to be talking about test preparation, getting yourself ready for the test, managing that test anxiety so while you're in the moment and, and sitting down and taking the test so that you're feeling comfortable, some specific strategies that you can use depending on the type of question you're facing, and then using feedback to improve your future performance. So you know, if you did really well on a test, what did you do to prepare yourself that set you up well? If you did had problems, what can we do um, to change that in the future? So we can think about test taking kind of like running a race, right? So you don't just wake up and say, hey, I'm gonna go run this 5K, right? You have to do some prep work. You have to, first you have to train. And so we're gonna talk about that to start. Studying is more than just sitting down with a book or with your notebook and looking at your notes or looking at you know, your sessions on the computer. There's multiple ways that we can really improve your test performance. And we want, really want you guys, if you're going to be, everyone's busy, right? Everyone has a bazillion things going on. So we want you to be able to get the most out of your, your study sessions. So one of the important parts about that, or, or the important things that are contributing to studying, is sleep. And, uh, you know, we've heard more and more about this in the news lately, but sleep is really important in many domains of your life, including your cognition. So when we talk about cognition, we're talking about your thinking skills. We know that people with poor sleep hygiene um, ha ha tend to do worse in school, and that's younger kids and that's college students alike. So this is kind of goes across all age groups. So what does poor sleep hygiene mean, right? That is when you wake up early throughout the week, you're waking up at 6.30 every day to get to work or get to school, and you're going to sleep, you know, at like midnight, you know, 11, something like that. But on the weekend, you're like, sweet, I get to sleep in, and you sleep in until 11 in the morning, right? So this erratic sleep schedule is, is problematic, and it's not good for you. Shortened sleep. So there have been some studies that show that about, you know, when you only get six hours of sleep a night for couple weeks, that's essentially the same. Your cognitive performance is the same as not having slept for 48 hours straight. Okay, so how many of you are getting, you know, about six hours of sleep a night, right? <laughs> Maybe less, you know? So that ends up affecting your, your, your cognition negatively. Poor sleep quality, too. So if you're waking up a lot of times throughout the night to go to the bathroom because you've got an infant at home that's, you know, not letting you sleep, um, all these things are, are going to negatively affect your performance. 
And we know that students with sleep disorders actually tend to have worse grades and they tend to have more mental health problems as well as compared to people who don't have sleep disorders. So if you know you've got major sleep issues going on, um, if you know that you know, your, your partner is telling you that you're snoring all through the night and you know, maybe you have sleep apnea, all these things can um, really contribute. So those are things to get checked out by your doctor and, and to get some, um, some help with. The, the other piece of this that I will mention before we move on is the all-nighter. So, you know, who's pulled the all-nighter getting a project together, mm -hmm. studying for a test, right? Mm -hmm. um, doing that actually tends to lower your performance in general because you're, you're not at your peak. You're tired throughout the day. There have been some studies looking at, like, even Navy SEALs, right, who are sleep-deprived and who have to do things. If you take some caffeine, it'll improve your performance in certain areas, like visual-spatial areas, um, you'll be a little more alert, but their shot performance, so their accuracy, like, while well, shooting wasn't as good. So, you know, it, caffeine helps you for a little bit, but it doesn't help you long term. And actually, long term, it messes up your sleep more. Other pieces that are really important um, are exercise. Um, and I'm sure no one needs to be told, okay, you need to exercise, right? But there's been studies that have shown that regular exercise improves your cognitive performance as well or can benefit cognition. Now a lot of this has been done in older adults right now. Um, we know that older adults who continue to exercise and stay busy do better long term. They stay healthier, they stay independent longer, but there's been some research that shows that younger people who are physically active, there's benefits in midlife, and then people who are really active midlife, there's benefits as they age as well, too, so as they become um, a senior citizen. So regular exercise really is beneficial. Um, diet also, there's increasing amounts of research that show that diet is really important. Again, another thing that none of us need to be told, right? But we think about it as maybe changing the way our body looks or but we don't necessarily think about the way it may affect our thinking and our cognition and our academic performance. So that is one that is really important to think about as well. Um, we know, especially as people age, when they have vitamin B deficiencies, they can start to look like there's dementia. And that's always one of the first things when elderly folks come in and they're really confused. That's one of the first things they'll kind of look at is, you know, are there nutritional deficiencies with them? Um, we've also, there's more in uh, research with trans fats, so if you eat a lot more trans fats, you tend to have, that may negatively affect your cognition, so those are things like fried foods, processed foods, things like that. Um, and omega-3s have been shown to be beneficial, so eating, you know, your fatty fishes like salmon and things like that, your flax seeds, there's other ways you can, you can get those things in. So those will all benefit your cognition too. So eating a big piece of salmon the night before your test is not going to help you on your test performance, right? But if you make positive changes to your diet over time, that can be beneficial. The other thing I always like to bring up when we're talking at colleges in, in this kind of setting is alcohol use. So alcohol use does negatively affect your cognition, which I think that you are probably aware of, right? Um, no one's surprised. They've all had the drunk friend who's <laughs> slurring their words or can't remember what happened. But Long-term alcohol use and abuse, specifically, um, really does negatively affect your memory, problem-solving, visual, spatial skills. So we know that people who maybe would classify as alcoholics, alcohol abusers, um, at a younger age, if they stop using, their cognition and their performance on cognitive tests does get better. So, you know, three, four weeks down the road, we start seeing improvements again. But we do know that if you abuse for long periods of time, you don't get that same kind of rebound effect. So something to, to think about there. So when we've, we've talked about kind of the sleep piece, the exercise piece, the nutrition piece that are all parts of studying and part of doing well on tests, there's also that managing your environment, right? So how many of you have tried to study while your phone is on and you're listening to music and the TV's on and your kid is coming to bother you or your roommate is coming to bother you, right? So how much of that information do you retain? Not so much, right? So we know that you need to reduce distractions. You need to go somewhere where it's quiet, where you can actually focus on your, 
on your work. That means you need to turn off your phone and not be checking Facebook. You know, you need to kind of reduce those, those distractions. Now the caveat to that is there has been some research recently that show individuals with ADHD, does everyone know attention deficit disorder, right? So some of those folks who, who may need to fidget more actually may benefit from having some fidgeting. So some of the studies they've shown students um, sitting on like those, bo like those exercise balls. So having some stimulation, having like something in your hand to kind of fidget with, even chewing gum, there's been some research that that little bit of fidgeting can be beneficial. Um, and so this is where we'll talk later about knowing yourself and getting feedback, right? So if you go to the quietest library ever and you study and you've reduced all your distractions and you realize, okay, I can't, it's a little too quiet for me, then you add a little something in, right? Maybe quiet music that doesn't have words, you know, or um, you have something to kind of fidget with while you're, while you're studying. The other part of managing your environment is getting into a comfortable setting, right? So comfortable means, you know, somewhere where you can sit, where there's adequate lighting, where um, you're not going to fall asleep though, right? So we've all seen people studying slash sleeping, you know, in a library setting, right? So you need to find that fine, that fine balance of, of being comfortable, but not so comfortable you doze off. And part of that then is, is studying when you are alert, right? So many of us will go to school all day, work all day, then take classes, then do whatever home responsibilities we might have, then we start studying at 10 o'clock at night, right? So that's probably not the time of day that most of us are most alert. Some people are night owls and that's when they do really well, right? But for most of us starting to study when we're already fatigued, when we've kind of used up all of our you know, cognitive energy throughout the day, that's not the best time to be doing your work. Um, so you need to figure out when that time is for you. Some people are morning people, some people are, are night owls. You know, if you're starting to study and you realize you're falling asleep and you can't concentrate, it might be better to go to sleep, get your rest, and wake up earlier in the morning and start fresh then. Um, studying at the same time in the same place every day is also beneficial. So we're starting to form habits, right? We get our body used to certain things. So, you know, when we walk into our kitchen, we may suddenly feel hungry, right? Our body's kind of conditioned to, to feel that way. Same for studying. If you set up a study routine, that's going to benefit you. You're going to be able to better concentrate and get the most out of your session. However, I have, can't tell you how many people have told me, well, I can't understand why I can't concentrate. Um, you know, I'm thinking of one person in general who was working and just, just couldn't concentrate, couldn't get his work done. And he's telling me all about it. And he was working 16 hours a day and he um, took one break. And that was the only time he left his computer was to get lunch. And that is not a good way to make use of your time, right? No one can concentrate for that long. It's not beneficial and then you become inefficient, right? And so that study time isn't necessarily beneficial. So you need to take breaks throughout your study time, you know, once an hour, stand up, stretch, do a little something, and then come back to it. You also need to study to the type of learner you are. So you guys, I think everyone has one of these quizzes, the what is your learning style? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, learning style inventory, excuse me. So we will, um, we'll be talking about that a little bit more towards the end. So some study skills um, that you can use in particular when you actually are studying is studying over time versus rather, up that, rather than all at once. So this is kind of, you, in, if you take a psych class, you may hear about this as spaced practice, right, versus cramming everything in. Cramming um, is not a good general strategy for step, test taking. It, you know, you can cram for the last few minutes, maybe before your test, and then dump it real quick, but it's not a good way to get a lot of information in and to retain that information. Um, so you need to kind of study, set, you know, if you know you have a test coming up in a month, then you set a study schedule where you're studying every day for, you know, even half hour is better than just pulling an all-nighter the night before and trying to cram everything in. Repetition is also beneficial, so that fits with that same idea of cramming is not the best way to do it. You need repetition, that repeated exposure 
is very beneficial. So seeing that information over and over again, hearing it, um, you know, if you have an ability to listen to your class lecture, you see the lecture, then you have an ability to listen to it at home again. If you guys have that ability with some of your classes, right, you can pull it up and listen to the lecture again. Sometimes, you know, I've put lectures and stuff on my phone, and then you can listen to it as you're driving, right? Don't be a distracted driver. But you can, you know, if you've got a long commute, you can kind of listen to this, some of that information. That's not active studying, but it's a good way to hear some of that information and get repeated exposure. Two studies, there was a recent study out um, where they looked at kind of beneficial, the most beneficial ways to, to kind of study is answering practice questions. So when a professor gives you test questions or when there's, you read a chapter in your book and there's questions at the end, practicing going over, answering that skill, going over the answers, the, the justification for why that is the right answer is an effective and beneficial study um, technique. Same for elaborating on how new information is related to your known information, why facts are true. So what this really gets at is you want to be actively studying, not just reading. You need to be kind of thinking about it, making connections. And we know that that strengthens the neural networks. That's, that's going to be beneficial to your brain. It's going to be beneficial to your studying and your performance on tests as well. Any questions about any of that? I'm speaking quickly. I feel like I'm speaking quickly. So we talked a little bit about you know your test is in a month, right? So you need to set goals. You need to figure out how am I going to get to that point where I am going to do well on this test because I've set goals, I've figured out how I want to study. So there's a few steps that make it makes goal setting successful and more, make you more likely to hold on to um, and actually achieve your goal. One is write it down, right? So when we know when we write something down, when we post it up maybe in our house, on our bathroom mirror, we have a sticky note saying, I am going to do this, that helps. It's another reminder. We also need to make our goals realistic, achievable, and personal, right? So I was joking with a colleague that um, I'm going skiing at the end of the month, and unfortunately my snow pants are too tight, and so I need to lose about 10 pounds in two weeks. Well, that's not a realistic goal, right? I might need to go buy some new sweat at snow pants, right? So we need to, setting a goal of, you know, when you're getting a, a D in a class and you're like, well, I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to have an A and I don't really have time to study and I've got all these credits and I've got all this stuff going on home. So maybe your more realistic goal would be, you know, B minus. Like, you know, you've got to be able to figure out what is a reasonable goal for you because when you don't achieve goals, it doesn't feel so good, right? So we need to have something that's going to be achievable and realistic and then personal to you, right? So if we set a goal that someone else wants for us or someone else says you need to do this versus I've decided I want to do it, what do you think you're more likely to achieve, right? So when it's meaningful to you, when it's something you personally want, it's going to be more, more likely to happen. Same for when it's positive and specific. So I could say I am, instead of saying, you know, I'm going to um, stop being so distracted, you can say, I'm going to study for 10 minutes without being distracted. It's a, it's a slight change in the way we phrase it, but it, when we think, know things are positive, when we phrase them in a positive way, we're more likely to, to work on them. Setting time frames is important, right? So I'm, I'm just, I'm going to study more is very vague, it doesn't really get you any goal. I'm going to study more for this week, you know, what test am I going to study for? Finding supports is helpful, so recruit the buddy in your class who's studying for the same thing. You can study as a group, or you can check in with one another. And you need to monitor your progress, right? So if I'm tracking this, I'm going to keep the track on my phone, I'm going to study for half an hour every day for my history exam, and at the end of the week, if I've done that, then I get to go have a beer with my friend. Right? So finding a way to kind of reward yourself and, and monitor that you're actually hitting those goals. So for example, your desire could be, I want a better grade in history, but your goal would be, I'm going to study history for 45 minutes every day until my final exam in one month. I'm going to set a reminder on my phone, right? Really good way, because that reminder tells you, you know, hey, get busy. And at the end of each week, I'm going to reward myself by spending time with my friends. So we're specific here. 
We're setting up a way to monitor our progress. We're giving ourselves reminders with the supports, and, and we're more likely to achieve our goal that way. So in terms of test anxiety, um, this is something we've all experienced, even if it's not a problem all the time, right? Everyone has sat down at a test and been like, <sighs> right? So anxiety is a very normal reaction. It's that fight or flight, which I think we've probably all heard of at times, right? Biologically, this makes a lot of sense, right? Biologically, our body is responding to a threat because that test is threatening to us in some way, right? It's threatening to our, our sense of worth, it's threatening to our grade or our scholarship, it's threatening to what we've got to tell you know, our, our parents or our spouse when we come home about how we did. So this is, it's very normal for our heart to start beating fast, we start sweating, you know, you've got the sweaty palms, it's harder to even concentrate, um, that nausea or that butterflies in the stomach that you guys have all heard about. And oftentimes we don't always put this together that, oh, this is anxiety. This is what's bothering me. Um, I'm nervous. We just kind of think, oh, I'm feeling sick, right? So recognizing that you're having that anxiety is really important. Now, anxiety can actually be a good thing for us, right? So we know there's this Yerkes-Dodson law, and there's some, it'll be taught, it's taught as a law, but there's some variations of it now. But basically what, it's, what this shows you is that your per, you, as your that anxiety increases a little bit, your performance actually gets better, right? So you got to have a little something riding on the line, and you're going to be more attentive. You're going to be a little more aroused. You're going to have better performance. But over here, if you're really anxious, your performance is actually going to be worse because you're too anxious, and so you can't concentrate, and so you're distracted. So we have to find that sweet spot where there's just enough to get you motivated to study or to focus on what you need to do, but not so much that you can't concentrate and can't perform. So what can we do? Angie earlier mentioned this um, STOP acronym. And it's a mindfulness technique, and mindfulness has been in the news a lot lately. And these, there's bookmarks that are loose up there, they're in your binder. But the idea is when you start picking up on those signs, like, oh, I've got the butterflies, or oh, I'm really clenching my jaw, or oh, I'm sitting down and I just know I'm panicking here, right? So you stop, you take a deep breath, and we'll talk about breathing in a minute. You observe how you're feeling and kind of say, okay, I'm anxious. It's okay to be anxious. I'm gonna take this test and I'm gonna proceed. And you can do this in any sort of setting that you're, that you're, you know, this works for anxiety, but it also works for feeling kind of depressed. It works for feeling really anger, um, angry, kind of like, oh, I'm angry because of this and it's okay and, and I'm gonna move on. Other techniques that are really good for um, anxiety and test management is visualization. So you get in your seat, you picture yourself wherever that nice relaxing spot is for you, on the beach, um, you know, at home, playing video games, whatever it is to kind of bring you down for a few minutes and, and cool and relax you. Um, relaxation breathing we're going to talk about in a minute. Progressive muscle relaxation is another great um, technique where it's, you kind of will flex your muscles, right? And you're, so you clench your hands, think about it, then you say relax, and you relax your hands. Then you clench your forearms and relax them. And you move and do your all, di all your different muscles um, and, and groups throughout your body. So it's a way of kind of grounding you, bringing you back into the moment, because anxiety can take you way far away really quickly, right? You, your head starts spinning. Well, if I pass, if I fail this test, I'm going to fail out of school. I'm not going to pass this class. And if I pay, don't, I already paid for this class. And, and your head just starts going and going and going, right? So we need a way to slow that down. All this happens. Balancing your thoughts is another great technique too. So if I, if I fail this exam, I'm going to fail this class. They're going to kick me out of school. So it's slowing yourself down and saying, if I fail this class, this test, I'm going to talk to the, you know, the professor, and I'm going to figure out what I can do, and I'm going to balance. I'm going to have some balance. So I'm not going to go from zero to catastrophe, right? I'm going to figure out a way to kind of see somewhere in between. Distractions also great, right? So as you're sitting and waiting for your exam to come out, you can start counting ceiling tiles, right? You can start thinking about looking at the back of everybody's head. How many people have brown hair? How many people have blonde hair? How many people have no hair? How many people have black hair, right? There's lots of different ways that you can distract yourself by what's going on in the room 
just enough to take off that edge so that you can focus, right? So if we think about that curve again, instead of being way over here, you can bring yourself back up to where you can have a more optimal performance. Relaxation breathing is also called diaphragmatic breathing. So the diaphragm is this muscle here, right? Kind of divides your thoracic and abdominal cavities, your, your abdomen and your, your chest. And that muscle moves and it helps compress the lungs and is a more effective way of breathing. You also have these intercostal muscles, the muscles that are in between your, your ribs. And those are kind of an accessory piece, right? So they help you, but what we really want to use is your diaphragm for most of your breathing. It's a more efficient way to breathe and it's a more, um, it, it's more, it, it reduces your anxiety, increases your oxygenation level, which is going to help you feel better. So, if you all place one, it doesn't probably help with the scarf on, but if you place one hand on your abdomen and one hand on your chest, and you want to breathe in slowly. Now, when you breathe in, you want to have this lower hand, you're going to feel it rise. Now, how many of you only feel your chest rise when you're breathing in? you're only feeling your chest rise, you're using those accessory muscles, your intercostal muscles. This takes some practice to kind of develop, but you want your, you're going to feel your diaphragm is working when your, your lower hand is rising. And when you exhale, that hand is going to fall. So the hand on your chest is going to stay still for most of the time. Now, there is an app, it's actually um, designed for veterans, it's called the Breathe to Relax app, it's free. It's on uh, in Google Play and it's on you know um, the Apple Store as well, and it actually does a really great demonstration of how to do this breathing, and you have a way to track your anxiety as well too. So right on there, you can track how stressed am I. You do the breathing for a little while, and then you rate your anxiety again, and it helps you keep track. The really nice thing about this is you can start figuring out, okay, well I'm really getting anxious every time I have this kind of thing coming up. You know, this might be my trigger. This is what's bothering me. And then maybe you can do something about it, right? It also has visualization exercise. It'll show you like a nice, you can choose a rainforest scene or you can choose a beach scene. So you get some of that other feedback as well. So another thing that's really good, this is something you want to do for a couple minutes every day. It's not an immediate fix. Um, so if you just only do this when you're anxious and sitting down to take a test, it's not going to be as beneficial as if you kind of practice this. And eventually you don't have to have your hands there so people aren't staring at you wondering, you know, what you're doing, you know, as you sit there getting ready for, for your test. So we've talked a little bit about preparation piece, right? So now we're ready for the race. We're ready for the test. And Angie, I'm going to hand it over to Angie who's going to talk a little bit more about, about that piece there. Um, a few things uh, to go with what Carolyn said. Um, Dr. Prente uh, noted in a class I was in that it takes five repetitions for the average person to remember something. So if you're trying to remember something for a test and it's something you just can't get, think try to do it five times over and a typical person will remember after five repetitions. And also he pointed out that you're most effective if you study in 20 minute blocks, take a five minute break, 20 minute blocks again. There's been a lot of research to show that the the brain can only handle about 20 minutes of active learning at a time before it needs to take a break. So in those three hour classes you have at night sometimes, so you're going to have to kind of take your own break, maybe stop and do the diaphragmatic breathing that Carolyn talked about, or maybe doodle for just a couple seconds on the side of your paper. Take yourself out of the moment and then come back in, and you remember up to a thousand times more information they found if you can take that break after about 20 minutes. And diaphragmatic breathing is more difficult than women, than for men, and especially women that have had children. For a lot of anatomical reasons there, it's harder for women to get a lot of um, diaphragmatic support because this, it's a closed system, this breathing pattern. So women may have to practice a little bit more to try to get some diaphragmatic breathing. So the next part, Carolyn's talked about all the research, and now I'm going to talk about panic day and you're in the test. Don't change your routines. Don't try to do something new. Trust what you know when you walk in that room. You know, make sure you get up, do your regular, regular routine, get something to eat, come in, feel confident, feel ready, know your breathing techniques if you need to, and you're going to do very, very well. On test day, there's four key things to know. These are very simple things that we learned way back in 
you know, first grade, we've got to listen to the directions, read your directions, rely on your first impressions, again, trust yourself, and then leave yourself time to review. If you think about those four things when you go in, I need to listen, read, trust myself, and review, you're going to do okay. So, seems really easy. Do those things, I read some directions, I trust myself, I review it, I get an A, in theory. But that's not what's going to happen. We all know we're still going to have some anxiety. So what we're going to go through now are how to look at the questions that you have on the test and also what are some quick things that you can do when you walk in the room. The first thing I always recommend is kind of the dump that Carolyn alluded to before. There's going to be a formula that you're going to have in your head. There's going to be dates. There's going to be somebody's name that are in your head that just dump onto the paper. Write them down on the back of the paper, the margins. Get out as much as you can out of your head to kind of free up space for the rest of your retrieval process to go. So you want to do a big mind dump and get it all out there. The second thing I always recommend is that you read through the entire test. Just look at it. You know, if there's essay questions in the back, are there multiple choice, or they fill in the blank? Look at all the different questions before you start so you know what to expect. Because you don't want to start taking your test and then realize you got 10 minutes left and you have two essay questions at the very end. You know, so make sure you get a feel for the whole test before you begin. You also want to go ahead and start to answer some of the questions that are easier for you. If something's really hard, just skip it. Don't spend 10 or 15 minutes trying to figure it out. Because what you're going to find is as you go through the test, you're going to get more comfortable. You're going to relax a little bit as you go on. And then your retrieval process or your memory processes are going to start to kick in because you're going to see key words in there that will link you back to other things. And another key concept in cognitive training is success breeds success. So if you start to answer questions, you're going to start to feel better the more questions you get answered. So remember, skip the harder questions to start with. You know, go ahead and get some things under your belt and then come back to those. I put a star, I put an X. I'm very famous for just making marks next to questions and coming back later. Because what I find is as I do a test, I get more comfortable, like I said, and I start to go, okay, I can do this, and I can go back and make better decisions. And use your energy to take the test, not to get frustrated by it. So you have to go in with a positive attitude, which sounds terrible when you're going into that religion class where nothing makes sense, and she changes the information every single time you're in the class. But go in with a positive attitude that success breeds success, you're going to do much better. Emotional regulation is something that Carolyn and I talk about all the time. Your ability to perform at optimal status really relies on how well you can control your emotions. If you can control your emotions, control your anxiety, you're going to find life outcomes across the board are going to be a lot better because you'll be a better problem solver and you'll have better attentional skills. The first type of question we're going to talk about are multiple choice questions. You see these quite a bit. They're the, you know, most professors like them. They're kind of quick, easy. But they're also good for you as a student because the information is in there. So you don't need to remember every single thing because the answers should trigger you in or prime you to what the right answer is. It's called a priming or kind of giving you the clue of what should be there. There's a few things to look for when you take multiple choice. I'm not going to read through them all because you guys can do that. Always look for the main idea, and look for statements that begin with always, never, none, except, most, or least. Because they're probably not the right answer. They found that professors don't tend to use those. They use all of the above, or A and not B, but they tend not to use words like always, never, none, except, most, or least. They're too encompassing. Eliminate the unlikely answers first. So use your process of elimination. Go through, cross out, I mean, literally cross out with a pen so you don't have to look at them. And then go ahead and um, mark an answer for all your questions. Make sure you've got a mark next to it to make sure that you've gone and um, taken care of it. And I like to use underlining keywords. That seems to be the best thing for me so I understand you know, what the question is asking me. For multiple choice, if you have to guess, these are four things that they've come up with that tend to um, help you make the best guess. The longest answer. You know, is usually the most correct one because professors aren't going to like spend a lot of time to write out extended, long, false answers. So the longest answers are usually correct. If two choices are similar, don't choose them. They're too close. 
it's, it's too tricky. They, professors aren't there to trick you, but they shouldn't be there to trick you. Maybe now and again you've got a professor who might do that. But they're too similar, it's probably not the right answer. Um, two opposites, if you do have to guess, that's good because it's easier for a professor to do the exact opposite um, than the accurate one. And the most general answer is usually the correct one. The second type of question is the dreaded essay question. And the goal of an essay question, remember, is not what you know, but how you're going to apply it and how you're going to explain it and support it. So you can read through here before you get it started, but the key thing for an, for an essay question is to write your outline. Make sure you take a few minutes to write an outline. And I know we all fought outlining, no one likes outlining, but outlining is the key way to make sure that you know what your main point is, what you're trying to address, that you have supporting details to it, and that you have good thought organization. What professors tend to look for is, do you have an organized thought pattern? Do you understand how A links with B when you write an essay question? And can you draw um, similarities between things and link how they're gonna go together? And you wanna make sure that you can support everything you do. And a nice a way to end an essay, sort of wrap up the central point again that you started with in your topic sentence. And then, in my case, write legibly. I write completely illegibly, so take your time <laughs> and write legibly because you will get marked off if they cannot read your handwriting. Just, just that's a personal tip there. Um, so my least favorite kind of question, and I find the hardest questions, are true false questions to me. I think they are the hardest questions um, to answer. Uh, it's my personal um, difficulty I have. So. Remember, if it's a true-false question, every aspect of the question has to be true. So every detail must be true in order for it to be true. So, and then look for extreme modifiers, both to make something true and make something false. And I've listed the extreme modifiers there. And then don't second guess yourself. Well, if there's a sequence of like seven or eight yes questions in a row, it's okay. The next one doesn't have to be false. Don't second guess yourself, just answer the question as it is up there. From true false, there's matching questions. So when you do matching, so you have a list of words on this side and a list of words over here and you have to match how they go together, use one side as your base, as your home, and then match across. Don't try to use a word here and then a word here and then come back here. Use one side as your base so you have an organized thought process of how they link over here. Read through all your answers first on this side before you start to make selections because there may be a better answer farther down, so make sure you do that. Cross off any of that you've used, but you will always want to start with a solid base on the one side versus the other side. And then from there, the fifth question type you're gonna have is fill in the blank and sentence completion. Again, a difficult one, but easier than true false in the sense because it does give you some context. You know, you'll know if it's one word or two words Within the sentence that you have, you'll have some keywords, hopefully, that will prime or you know, drive that retrieval process that you have. You want to make sure that if you don't, can't think of the word, like the technical word that you need, that you might write a descriptive answer. You may not get credit, but it will show the professor that you maybe understand the concept of what's going on, so that they may be able to help you think through how to remember that technical term next. So you want to show the professor that you were thinking it through, that you have some idea of what it is, but you may not just be able to retrieve that word. You also can use this um, strategy. If you don't know the keyword, just start to write down words that are sort of associated with it. And what you might do through that generative process or generating of different words, you might cue yourself in. A self-cue strategy, like, oh, that's the word. Like, Because some people need to see it to be able to retrieve it. So if you start to write words down, um, it may go ahead and cue you to what the right word is. The final kind of question you'll see on exam is a problem solving question, and that's usually in labs and scenarios. Allied health professionals like those um, case studies. You have a 53 year old patient, you know, status post um, tonsillectomy, you're seeing this, 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 and this. What are you going to do? Problem solve through it. So, what you need to do first is ask yourself, what am I trying to answer? What am I trying to find? What do I need in order to find that answer? Do I need to think about lab studies? Do I need to think about age? Do I need to think about um, comorbidities? What do I need to do with that? And then what are the steps that I should follow to solve the problem? 
is there a way to break this down and organize my thoughts to make sure I have an effective problem solving strategy? And finally, and this happens a lot with case studies, did I cover the whole problem? Because we tend to like get stuck in minutia and answer one sort of it and not look at the entire big picture. Um, that's, that's a very right side brain thing that we see a lot, especially when we treat is you can't see the forest through the trees. I mean, you're just looking at one little thing and you miss the whole big question and then you don't have it right. You may really know how to take somebody's blood pressure, but you don't see the whole picture and they're still gonna code out because you don't know all the other things that are going on. So we've talked a little about strategies to help you with answering the questions, and those are things that you can go back through. You're not gonna remember all the strategies I just talked about, so I didn't spend tons of time on them. So if you think you have difficulty with any of those type of questions, go back, reread those slides, ask us questions. Kylie can get in contact with us and we can help you there. But time management, like Carolyn alluded to, and we're talking about it again, is such an important part that we're gonna go through it real fast because in the test setting, you are sort of the slave to the clock. You've only got a little bit of time and you've got to use your time most effectively. So this is a good way to do it. Like I said, look over the entire test before you start so you know what's there. See if anything is weighted more than anything else. So if your essay questions are worth 80% of your exam, start there, right? Because if you get all those right, you got to be at minimum, right? Which isn't too bad. If you start at the multiple choice in the front, and you get through all those, and you only get through part of your, your essay question, you might only be at 60%. So make sure you do the most weighted part of your test first. Plan your time to review. You know, tell yourself I need five minutes at the end and stick to it. Better to go back and review than to try to rush through and make some mistakes. If you can have your phone or where, nobody wears a watch anymore, go back through. Um, you know, have your watch or your phone there so you can see the time. I don't know if you're test taking, I don't know if you take tests in certain rooms, um, clock on the wall, ask the proctor, if there's a proctor or a teacher, to give you a five minute warning. Those are some things that you can do. And don't feel uncomfortable asking the teacher if you want a five minute warning. I'd be more than happy to give you a few minutes to go ahead and do that. So when that time management, we talked about reviewing, and this is some of the things that you need to kind of go through when you review. You want to proofread your essays for grammar and spelling. You want to make sure you've answered all the questions. So if you've marked things next to the questions, make sure you've gone back and actually answered them. And then go back through and read them, because what you find is you make more errors when you start your test than towards the end of the test, because you're nervous, your anxiety is a little bit heightened, so you tend to skip words. You miss the nots, the always, you may, um, reverse numbers, you may reverse some words, double negatives, some professors will use double negatives, and when you're initially taking a test, when your anxiety is a little bit higher, you're gonna miss some of those things. So go back and definitely reread the beginning of what you've done. So we've taken the test, we've prepped for it, we're ready, we've taken the test, we've mastered our questions, we've reviewed it, and now it's after the test. What do we do now? So here's some strategies that we look at after the test. The biggest one I can say is if there's a review offered by the professor, go to it. It shows that you care, it shows that you want to improve, and you're going to start to learn your professor's teaching style and what your teacher values most. So when the next test you'll say, okay, he really wants me to apply my knowledge, or she really wants me to look at numbers, she's a number person. So if you go to the review, you're going to get some idea of what that teacher values, and you're also going to show your face, which your teacher is going to appreciate too, and it shows that you care. And as much as we don't want to think there's bias, there tends to be bias. And if you're there all the time and trying to get better, that professor is going to be more apt to extend office hours for you. If you go to ask for help, they may be there um, to help you more than that. The next thing we're going to talk about is, you know, in this plan to review is determining what your learning style is. Because you may be taking tests and not using your appropriate learning style. And what you're going to find is you keep getting the same things wrong over and over again. And by learning your, your own personal style of, of learning, you're going to be more successful. So I took the, oh my goodness, look at Carolyn. Wow. So I took the learning style inventory, and I, um, I don't know if any of you did. So I'm 
I'm a visual learner, but almost balanced. I'm highly visual. Carolyn's like off the charts visual. Yeah. So if you guys want to take it and look at it, we're going to talk about what the learning styles um, are right now. But I'm going to give you a few key things um, right now. So visual learners are people who scored mostly A's on there. And that makes up 20% of the population are visual learners. I thought it would be higher, but it's only 20%. Auditory learners are people who learn through hearing. They're actually higher. 25% of the population are auditory learners. That is hearing by um, hearing and listening. That is my lowest way to, <laughs> to learn. Like this format for me is extremely difficult. Like lecture format. That's why I use and you'll see my hands are just all over because I'm just not a listener. And then kinesthetic learners, these are the people that learn by touching or doing, and they're 27.6. Um, That's most people. No. So is anybody an auditory learner? You're an auditory learner? You're left-handed, aren't you? You are left-handed, yeah. <laughs> um, kinesthetic learners, people who touch or do. So everybody else is a visual learner. Yeah, so go through I it. I can't do it while you guys talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just true. You can do it on your own. You'll have the totally information. Totally fine, no yeah. So, so that says a lot. You're probably not. No. Like, yeah, you're not an auditory I'm learner. <laughs> or you're a really super strong auditory learner that can't do anything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, so most likely you're a combination of all or both types of learners. And what learning style is actually dependent on quite a bit is your emotional regulation. In high stress environments, you're going to be more of a kinesthetic learner or an experiential learner you because you can't listen. Because in high stress, we tend to like, not be able to what we call encode and consolidate information well. So the information comes in, we hear it, but we can't figure out how to make sense of it because we're on 94 and we're changing the tire and cars are zooming by. And I can't listen to you tell me how to change this tire. No, I need to just, I need to do it. Because in high stress, auditory is dampened quite a bit, and you have to just do. It's sort of like fight or, that um, fight or flight. You've got to make action to make it happen. But easy things, you can just hear. So you know, if you for some of you, a phone number may be something you can just hear because that's an easy learning environment for you. For me, I still need to write it down. But for a lot of people who are auditory, they can just do it. Or if you need to learn, you know, to put. You know, the cat food, you're watching your neighbor's house, the cat food needs to go over here. Well, that's not stressful, you know. So you can just hear the information and be fine and remember it. Um, but if they have a tiger that has to be fed steak and you need to wear a suit and you need to do this, you're probably going to have to, like, work through it and think about it in order to do it and not just hear um, what they have to say. So we're going to talk about visual learners um, just real fast. You guys can read through um, these characteristics. I'm going to tell you some other um, things about visual learners. So visual learners, their best type of test is something where they can diagram or write an essay. So when they have to actively do something and be able to put their thoughts down, um, their worst type of test for a visual learner is an auditory test. So if they have to hear it and come back and produce um, a response, that's more difficult for them. They definitely need to diaphragm, read maps, do essays. Some suggestions for people who are visual learners is that um, if they can diagram what they're doing, if they can make pictures to support what they've heard and doing their note taking, use flashcards, make lists, you know, carry pictures around um, with them, that will definitely help them. Um, this is totally me taking detailed notes. I sit towards the front of the class because I'm visually distracted by things that are around me. Um, and I definitely benefit from having the ability to look at something to understand it. I'm at a committee. Um, with Kylie at home and you know I have to write everything down and draw things or I I walk away not remembering what, what I've just done. Auditory learners, these are the people who do best um, when they have to write a response to a lecture that they've heard or oral exams. So when you have to defend your dissertation, when you have to stand up and give a presentation, when you have to stand up and give a speech, your best that way. Um, your worst type of tests are the ones where you have to read long passages and then um, write the answers to it. And auditory learners don't like to be timed. They like to have kind of open-ended. Um, they tend to like to do things slowly, think through them, make a plan. Um, they tend to speak a little bit slower. Um, they tend to like, have to get lots of auditory feedback. And they like to repeat things. 
And which is really interesting because I never picked this up. If Kylie's an auditory learner, and it's just a random thing. They don't really care about matching their clothes or how their like color, how things color coordinate, because visually they, it doesn't matter to them. They can explain to you why they decided to wear purple pants and a yellow and orange striped shirt. They can explain it to you why it why it works for them, but they don't care that things match. They don't care how things look visually appealing, which is not you, because your house is very nice. No, you like things to match, but so they don't tend to do that. And when you'll find auditory learners need lots of auditory input, so you the humming and the, there's music, there's always something going on in their auditory system. And that kind of keeps them aroused and able to learn. Kind of like, it's, if it's too quiet in the library, you can't study. Kind of thing that goes on with them. Kinesthetic learners. I really like to work with kinesthetic learners. Um, in my practice, these are the people I really, really like to work with. They're very active people. They need lots of breaks. They need to put their hands on things. And they like to do cooking and construction and art and help them learn. Um, so the strategies that we can come up with when you're a kinesthetic learner are a little more varied and a little more, um, a little more fun. So a kinesthetic learner, their best type of test is one that's um, short um, definitions, fill in the blanks, and multiple choice. They don't like essays, just like the auditory learners, because it takes too much time. These are the fidgeter people. Um, to help study when you're a kinesthetic learner, you should study in short blocks, take lab classes, make sure you can get up and walk around. Um, study in groups. Kinesthetic learners tend to do much better in groups because it's more dynamic. Um, typically, there's more um, chance to exchange ideas, hands-on, construct something in a group. My son is a very kinesthetic learner. He is art, construction, hands-on. So what we've done at school is he has Velcro that he has at his desk that he can just kind of rub his hands on. And so as a, as a student, what you can do is you can make your own. Just put the scratchy part of Velcro like inside your folder, and you can just kind of rub your hand on it if you need some sort of um, feedback. He can't maintain his attention if he doesn't have something to do. His opening words for first grade, and like, do you like it? And he said, yeah, I like first grade. But all they make me do is sit, 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 sit. I can't just sit, sit, sit. And he can't. <laughs> so what we did is we came up with just Velcro. He has Velcro under a desk that he, you know, puts his hands on. We have him chew gum sometimes. And the other thing as a kinesthetic learner is if you exercise before your test, it calms the nervous system down and increases your cognitive performance. Mm -hmm. So you may think, like I did this morning when I got up, I don't have time to go to the gym, but I knew I needed to calm my <laughs> central nervous system down. So I went, so I did. I went to the gym, and I was much better. So what you may find is even, it sounds silly, do it in your apartment, probably not in the hallway, you know, if you just jump up and down, just, you know, a few times, five or ten times, you're going to calm your nervous system down. When I run a group, we always start with a gross motor task, then we... Um, go to a fine motor task and then a cognitive task because you need to calm your um, central nervous system down, especially when you're a kinesthetic learner to learn the most. So we've touched on what your learning style is to help yourself out. So being aware of what your learning style is will help you. If you've been trying to study in that library where it's super, super quiet, you know, and you're an auditory learner, it's probably not going to work for you. So try a different environment. <laughs> and if you're a visual learner and you need more quiet, you know, get out of the dorm room where there's a party going on next door. If you're a kinesthetic learner, figure out ways that you can make models or, you know, interact with what you have to do. Ask the professor if there's a different way, there's somewhere I can go to learn about this, a field trip, a museum, that type of thing. So you have lots of internal things you can do. You can figure out what kind of learner you are. You can master the questions, like how to take the test with questions. You can do your deep breathing and all that. But it's a lot to hold on to yourself. There's external things you can do to help yourself too. And that's where Kylie and her group come into play. It takes a community really to kind of help, you know, and don't be afraid to ask for help. I and mean, there's no stigma in asking for help, you know. When I'm stuck, I go to Carolyn. I'm like, I need some help with this. I don't understand what these test scores mean. Can you help me, you know? Or, you know, when I work with Kylie on a, a project, you know, let's go back and forth. Let's talk about what's going on here. You don't have to take it all on yourself. There's no need to do that. There's so many services to assist. You know, study groups are great. You know, you're going to support other people. You're going to feel good. You're going to find success there. 
And working together collaboratively really can expand um, your horizons and your knowledge, and you can apply things more. Lab, lab sessions are great. If you can get into a lab, go to a lab, because you're going to be able to hear it, do it, and see it. Those are great things to do. Um, TED Talks, I don't know if you guys know TED Talks, or the Khan Academy online. So if you're doing algebra and you don't know how to do fractions, I mean, the Khan Academy has great instructional videos. Um, it sounds like your school also has instructional videos on how to do things. So look those up. See your advisor. That's what they get paid to do. They're, they're here to help you. You know, we often think, I don't want to go there. I don't want to ask for help. But come to us for help. I love it when people come and ask me to help. You know, if you do um, fall into the category where you are eligible for accommodations, maybe you have a disability, a learning disability, a physical disability, the accommodations are extensive on what you can do. Um, it just Extending test time by five or ten minutes can be all you need to kind of calm yourself and allow yourself to succeed. Taking rest breaks, large print test books, I mean, they're out there if you need them. You know, but you may have to like think about it early on so you can get them ordered in that. There's a great libraries for the visually impaired and the deaf community around here that you can borrow things from. There's lots of things that we can do to accommodate your needs. And don't think of it don't think of it as stigma because it really is just bolstering what you already have. These are things to, um, they're not to, they're to augment what you already have is the best way to put it. So you have the skill, you just need a little bit of boost to augment it. We all need help. You know, I write extensive notes, you know, I have reminders on my phone. You all need something to augment what you do and this is, this is a really nice and I know that those services are available um, through your college. So this is the final slide. It has nothing to do with what we talked about today. I just really like this slide. Um, so and it's my idea of the perfect world. If math would just grow up and solve its own problems, everything would be great, you know? So, but it's not going to happen. Math is not going to grow up and solve its own problems. We're going to continually have to study and learn new things. The key things to take today are believe in yourself. Success really does breed success. And set yourself up to succeed by managing your time, managing your anxiety, and understanding what kind of learner you are and how that applies to um, what kind of test you're going to take. And the final thing is use your resources. Because I know you have a great resource. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kindly use your resource. So thanks for having us. Carolyn and I are here. If you need any more questions answered or if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah.